and welcome to the 2008 Sumner Canary Lecture. Um, I'm Jonathan Enton. I'm Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the Law School, uh, and it is my distinct honor to introduce today's program. Um, the Sumner Canary Lecture is a memorial uh, to the late Judge Sumner Canary, who was a judge on the Ohio Court of Appeals for the 8th District and uh, a former United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. The Sumner Canary Lectureship uh, is made possible through the generosity of uh, Judge Canary's widow, Nancy Canary, who's with us down here in the front row, and I think we ought to uh, recognize her generosity for this wonderful program. It is, uh, it, the Sumner Canary Lecture is probably the uh, premier uh, lectureship uh, of the Case Western Reserve University School of Law. It uh, has featured uh, a number of extremely distinguished jurists, including several Supreme Court justices and uh, a number of high profile uh, U.S. Court of Appeals judges. Uh, this year, uh, we are privileged to continue in that tradition uh, with Judge Michael McConnell of the United States Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Uh, uh, Judge McConnell is one of the nation's leading scholars in constitutional law. Uh, I can say this uh, with uh, considerable confidence, both because I am a constitutional law teacher who has read and cited a fair amount of Judge McConnell's work uh, over the years, uh, and also because I can tell you that Judge McConnell has had the good sense not to cite uh, much of anything uh, that I've written. Uh, <laughs> I, Judge McConnell uh, has a, an extraordinary career. Um, uh, his uh, first positions out of law school were as a law clerk to the late uh, Judge J. Skelly Wright of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, uh, and uh, as a, then as a clerk to uh, the late Justice uh, William Brennan. Uh, he spent several years uh, in government service in the Office of the Solicitor General and at the Office of Management and Budget before joining the faculty at the University of Chicago Law School uh, where he wrote some extraordinarily important work uh, on federalism, uh, church-state relations, and a variety of, of uh, similar uh, subjects. Um, for um, the last decade or so, uh, Judge McConnell has been a member of the faculty at the University of Utah College of Law. He has been on the bench uh, for about five and a half years now and uh, has uh, continued uh, to uh, do uh, some first-rate scholarship. At the same time, uh, Judge McConnell, excuse me, Professor McConnell, before he went on the bench, um, was a very successful and high-profile advocate before the Supreme Court. He has uh, argued close to a dozen cases there, uh, and some of them are uh, some very, very significant cases. Uh, we are privileged today to have uh, Judge Michael McConnell as the Sumner Canary Lecturer uh, speaking on uh, natural rights, enumerated rights, uh, and the Ninth Amendment. Judge McConnell? Thank you for that flattering introduction, and I, thanks to uh, Nancy Canary for making uh, this event uh, uh, possible. I'm quite honored to be in uh, this kind of uh, company, but it's also a particular pleasure to be here because uh, something Professor uh, uh, Enton did not mention is that uh, uh, my family hails from this part of, uh, of the world, and uh, when I was a little, although I grew up in Kentucky as a little kid, I was up almost for a few weeks, almost every summer visiting my uh, aunts and uh, uncles and cousins on the farm uh, uh, near Ravenna, east of here. And uh, I'm so thrilled that four of my uh, uh, cousins have uh, 
uh, come to uh, hear the lecture this afternoon. They, uh, 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 and uh, I really appreciate your, your, your coming, but it's, a, it's great to be uh, uh, back here. Um, so you know my subject, and I'll, it's, uh, I'll get to it. Uh, and what I'd like to do is to invite you to travel back in time with me uh, to the fall of 1787 and the summer of 1789, when representatives of the American people adopted the remarkable set of commitments called the Bill of Rights that so dominate and inspire our current understanding of constitutionalism. Now, some of the most contested questions for modern constitutional law stem from the decision of the first Congress to enumerate some, but necessarily not all, fundamental rights as part of our basic legal framework. For the most part, I will be talking about history on the assumption that some issues and problems are clearer at the inception than they can ever be to later generations. But also, as you may see by the end of this discussion, a re-examination of the rights jurisprudence of the beginning may offer new avenues for thought about how we might structure protections for civil liberties in an age in which we're all too conscious of the risks and dangers of judicial overreach. As everyone here no doubt remembers from introductory U.S. history, the Constitution, as it emerged from the Philadelphia Convention in September 1787, did not contain a Bill of Rights. This was not because of any theoretical or jurisprudential opposition to the idea of a Bill of Rights. That emerged later. It was simply for lack of time and attention. No one at the Constitutional Convention in 1787 thought to propose a Bill of Rights until September 12th, three and a half months after the convention began its work, at a time when the delegates were desperately putting the finishing touches on an agreed-upon plan of government. At that late date, the delegates were anxious to get home, anxious to begin the difficult process of securing ratification, and, uh, and they were unwilling to open what could be a Pandora's box of conflicting ideas about fundamental rights. Now, not all the delegates were so uninterested or so pessimistic about the difficulty of the drafting project. Uh, Colonel George Mason, who was George Washington's next door neighbor along the Potomac and Virginia, and had been the principal drafter of Virginia's acclaimed Declaration of Rights, urged the convention to preface the plan with a Bill of Rights, which he told them, and I quote, would give great quiet to the people, and with the aid of the state declarations, a bill might be prepared in a few hours. No doubt he was imagining that the convention would simply draw upon his own accomplishment in Virginia, you know, pride of, of authorship uh, and all that. Uh, others, though, were not so sanguine. Uh, they voted down the proposal by a thunderous margin of zero in favor to 10 states opposed. And Mason ended up voting against the adoption of the Constitution. He was the only delegate to do so based on its lack of a Bill of Rights. But the convention's rejection of Mason's proposal to include a Bill of Rights within the Constitution turned out to be the anti-federalist most potent issue during debates over ratification. The opponents of the Constitution hoped to send the document back to a second convention for a round of amendments, and the lack of a Bill of Rights was the most popular reason for doing so. As so often happens in politics, this demand for a Bill of Rights stimulated a response, reasons why a Bill of Rights might be a bad idea. For starters, there was the question of what such a bill would include. And here I want to uh, invoke General Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, of South Carolina, and he was a member of the Philadelphia delegation and then went back to support the Constitution back home in the ratifying convention in South Carolina, where he was asked why there wasn't a Bill of Rights in this Constitution. And after giving the standard Federalist uh, response, which we'll get to in just a moment, he had a special response for his uh, fellow South Carolinians, and he said, and I'm quoting from the ratification debate in South Carolina, I wish I could do his accent. Uh, another reason, says General Charles Coatsworth Pinckney, weighed particularly with the members from this state against the assertion of a Bill of Rights. Such bills generally begin with declaring that all men are by nature born free. Now, we should make that declaration with a very bad grace 
when a large part of our property consists in men who were actually born slaves. Enough said in South Carolina. But in addition to the born free clause, which C.C. Pinckney saw as a threat to southern slavery, prominent proposals for amendments con con included a lot of controversial items, such as limitations on Congress's power to tax, which is ever a popular issue, uh, limitations on the national military establishment, and more direct constituent control over senators and representatives through instructions and recall. Most Federalists regarded these ideas as dangerous and wrongheaded, but there was a very real possibility that they would be adopted if the Constitution were put up for amendment. So one reason to oppose a Bill of Rights was that it might contain items we disagree with. But the leading argument against a Bill of Rights was more theoretical in nature and more interesting. Defenders of a Constitution lacking a Bill of Rights argued, in the words of Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 84, uh, that a Bill of Rights would, quote, not only be unnecessary, but dangerous. Unnecessary because the Constitution had already protected against abuse by its careful enumeration of powers. Although the new federal government was given important powers, such as to regulate foreign and interstate commerce, to raise and support armies and the like, it was given no power to regulate or license the press or to establish a national religion or to do most of the other things that were feared uh, 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 in, um, with, res with respect to Bill of Rights protections. In light of the enumeration of powers, there was no need for a Bill of Rights, according to Hamilton. Indeed, as he said, quote, the Constitution is itself in every rational sense and to every useful purpose a Bill of Rights. Now, addition of a Bill of Rights would be dangerous because it was impossible to compose a complete, satisfactory, and compendious list of all the rights of the people and an incomplete enumeration would imply that items left off the list were no longer recognized as rights. Now, the first argument, while interesting, was clearly wrong, even if Hamilton did make it. Uh, the enumerated powers of the federal government might not extend to such things as regulating the press or establishing a national religion, but it is easy to imagine how various infringements on liberty could be employed as a means of effectuating any or all of the enumerated powers. Revenue agents searching for contraband might invade the security of the home without warrant or probable cause. Raising an army might entail conscription of Quakers or other religious objectors. Newspapers might be taxed out of existence. Cruel and unusual punishments might be used to punish crime. The right to keep and bear arms might be curtailed in the national capital, just to name a few examples. Now, on reflection, it is evident that enumerating the powers or ends of government would not protect against abusive means of carrying those powers into effect. So it was hard to argue that a Bill of Rights was unnecessary. The Federalist's second argument carried more weight. Here is how it was expressed by James Iredell at the North Carolina Ratifying Convention. Quote, it would not only be useless but dangerous to enumerate a number of rights which were not intended to be given up because it would be implying in the strongest manner that every right not included in the exception might be impaired by the government without usurpation, and it would be impossible to enumerate every one. Let everyone make what collection or enumeration of rights he pleases. I will immediately mention 20 or 30 more rights not contained in it. And I suggest you take up Iredell's challenge someday. Sit down some Sunday afternoon and try to draft a Bill of Rights that would contain every right that matters without being so vague that the list would be subject to misconstruction or evasion. Give the list to a friend and see how many rights you left out. Now this problem became embarrassingly obvious when the first Congress, buckling to popular demand, attempted to draw up a list. Without, after agreeing to what would have been the First and Second Amendments had they been ratified, having to do with the size of the House of Representatives and limitation on the power, uh, the House turned to the draft of what is now our First Amendment, although to them it was the Third Amendment. Uh, the longest debate was over religion. It was inconclusive. They then turned to the following proposal. <clears throat> the freedom of speech and of the press and the right of the people peaceably to assemble and consult for their common good 
and to apply to the government for redress of grievances shall not be infringed. I'm reading here from the Annals of Congress, the reports from the, uh, from the debates in the first Congress. Uh, well, sounds pretty good, right? Sounds pretty familiar. But immediately, uh, Theodore Sedgwick of Massachusetts, a, a pretty smart guy, by the way, stands up with an objection. And Sedgwick submitted to those gentlemen who had contemplated the subject, I'm still reading again, Mills, uh, what effect such an amendment would have. He feared it would tend to make them appear trifling in the eyes of their constituents. Uh, he says, you know, what, what's the point? Once you've specified freedom of speech, why do you have all the rest of this, like, assembly? I mean, back to Sedgwick. If a people freely converse together, they must assemble for that purpose. It is a self-evident, unalienable right which the people possess. It is certainly a thing that would never be called into question. It is derogatory to the dignity of the house to descend to such minutiae. He therefore moved to strike out the term assembly from what is now the First Amendment. Well, the immediate reaction was, came from uh, uh, Egbert Benson, a uh, uh, representative from New York, and you can almost hear his pompous and bureaucratic uh, uh, tone uh, when he says, the committee who framed this report proceeded on the principle that these rights belong to the people. They conceived them to be inherent, and all they meant to provide against was their being infringed by the government. You know, true enough, but does this answer Sedgwick's point? I mean, Sedgwick's point was that when you get into very high levels of detail with respect to some things, uh, then you pretty much have to do it with respect to everything else, or you're going to be uh, creating some problems for yourself. Or here, here's the way Sedgwick put it. He stands up in response to Benson. He says, um, if, the, if the committee were governed by that general principle, that is the principle that every inherent right needs to be uh, uh, in there, they might have declared, unless, this is where I want you to listen carefully, they might have declared that a man should have a right to wear his hat if he pleased, that he might get up when he pleased and go to bed when he thought proper, but he would ask the gentleman whether he thought it necessary to enter these trifles into a declaration of rights in a government where none of them were intended to be infringed. Good examples, don't you think? Well, up pops John Page of Virginia, and Page says the following. He says, um, the gentleman from Massachusetts, that's Sedgwick, who made this motion objects to the clause because the right is of so trivial a nature. He supposes it no more essential than whether a man has a right to wear his hat or not. But let me observe to him that such rights have been opposed and a man has been obliged to pull off his hat when he appeared before the face of authority. People have also been prevented from assembling together on their lawful occasions. What is page talking about? Just curious. This is an educated audience. Uh, how many people here, put, I'd like a show of hands, how many people know when, when, when Page says that a man has been obliged to pull off his hat just when he appeared before the face of authority, how many people know the incident that he's referring to? I see if, a, a few people, but most people don't. Most people don't. Everyone in that room during this debate would have known what Page was talking about because this was a, fam an, a familiar incident to, uh, 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 to Americans who knew their history, an incident involving William Penn, the, uh, the founder of the colony of Pennsylvania. And so so let, me, let me tell you the story of William Penn's hat. Um, uh, Penn, as you probably know, was a Quaker, and qu having Quaker religious services in England uh, was, at, and during the 17th century, was was unlawful. And so, uh, one fateful day, the authorities had uh, gone to the Quaker meeting house on Grace Church Street in London, 
and they had shut it down and locked it and prevented any worship service from taking place. And so the Quakers, including William Penn, go out on the sidewalk outside the street on, in, in Grace Church Street, and they have their, uh, uh, their meeting uh, outside, and Penn addresses the crowd. There are several hundred people there. He is then arrested uh, and charged with speaking to an unlawful assembly. Uh, he's brought into court and tried by a jury, and uh, he, uh, he, uh, the, the government brings in several witnesses that describe the fact that, in, that he was out there on Grace Church Street and speaking to a crowd of several hundred people. And Penn asks the judge, but uh, what crime am I being charged with? Where do you find that in the statute books? And the judge says, in the common law, which is to say the unwritten law. And uh, Penn has proceeded, uh, wants to argue to the jury that it is uh, not illegal in England uh, to, to address a crowd on the street, but the judges do not allow him to speak. They basically shut him down, and uh, the judge instructs the jury that their sole role is to find out whether he did it, and he instructed them that if he did it, it was in violation of the law, and so they should bring in a, 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 a verdict of guilty of addressing an unlawful assembly. Well, the jury goes out, and it takes, I mean, you'd think that's a pretty easy case, right? Because nobody really denied that he did it. Um, but they're out for hours. And then they come back, and the foreman of the jury, his name was Edward Bushnell, says to the ju judge, says, do you have a verdict? He says, I do. And they, what's the verdict? And he says, guilty of speaking on Grace Church Street. Well, the judge says, well, that doesn't, that's not a verdict. You, you have to f find him guilty of the crime. That would be like if somebody's charged with murder and the jury comes back and says, guilty of pulling the trigger. All right? You don't do that. You don't just find a fact. You actually have to, there has to be a verdict of guilt of the charge. But, uh, but the Foreman Bushnell says, that's all that I've been commissioned by the jury to say. I can't say anymore. And so the judge sends them back. Uh, and then they come out again, and the same thing happens. They use slightly different language, but they keep coming back, and they're de they decline to do anything other than just say what he did, but they will not find that it's a crime. Until finally, the judge gets so upset with the jury that he locks them up at night. Uh, the report of the case says uh, that they were locked up, quote, without meat, drink, fire, or tobacco. <laughs> or chamber pot, by the way. Uh, and he tells them to bring back a proper verdict. So the next day, deprived of tobacco and other necessaries, the jury comes back in and the judge says to Bushnell, do you have a verdict? And he says, yes. What's the verdict? And he says, not guilty. Well, that's the end of the matter, right? Except that the judge then says, uh, this is an obvious case in which the jury has defied my instructions, uh, and they have come back with an, uh, there, there's no way since he did this that he was not guilty. And so uh, he holds the jurors in contempt of court and gives them each a fine of 40 marks. And I don't, have, don't know how much money 40 marks is, but that was the fine that he gave them for contempt of court for bringing in this, uh, this verdict. Well, the jurors refused to pay, and so they are then thrown in jail for contempt of court for refusing to pay the fine. They then, Bushnell then uh, 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 swears out a writ of habeas corpus and goes to the high court with, uh, uh, to challenge the legality of the detention, the writ of habeas corpus being the traditional writ for challenging uh, uh, unlawful detentions, um, the same writ that's been involved in the Guantanamo uh, cases uh, recently. And the high court holds that they were improperly imprisoned and holds that, it is n that the judge is not entitled to coerce a jury to come in with the verdict of the judge's choosing, that the jury must be, the trial by jury means that the jury itself 
has the right to decide guilt or innocence, period. They do not have to follow the judge's instructions and may not be coerced by the judge. Well, this case, which is called Bushnell's case, stands as one of the most important uh, cases in uh, English and American constitutional history because that is essentially the case which establishes uh, the right of an independent trial by jury. Uh, so now Penn has been uh, acquitted, the jury is out of jail, and you might be asking, well, what about his hat? <laughs> I haven't mentioned his hat yet. So, but, and this is where the story really gets interesting. So Penn comes into the, to the courtroom to receive this, uh, this final verdict. And as I mentioned, he's a Quaker. Quakers do not believe in taking off their hats as a sign of, uh, of respect or subordination to other earthly uh, authorities. Uh, and so Penn, I mean, and at the time, this was, a, this was you know, an important aspect of, you know, of their hierarchical society. If you appeared before the king, you would had to take off your hat. And when the judge comes into the courtroom, you have to take off your hat. Well, Penn prudently Decline. He, he doesn't wear a hat that day. So he comes to the, to the courtroom bareheaded precisely so that he will not be put in the position of having to take or not taking off his hat uh, when the judge comes into the room. So just before the judge arrives, he's, he's there hatless. The, on the instructions of the judge, the bailiff claps a hat on Penn's head. <laughs> judge then comes in. Penn does not take off the hat, and he's then fined for contempt of court and thrown in jail. So they got him after all. <laughs> and so this is what Page meant when he said, uh, let me observe to him that such rights have been opposed, and a man has been obliged to pull off his hat when he appeared before the face uh, of authority. Uh, and people have also been prevented from assembling together on their lawful occasions. That is a description of, uh, of, uh, of Penn's case. Um, but, uh, and, and then but, uh, John Vining of Delaware says, well, if it doesn't do any harm, let's just pass the thing. He, he's a little tired of listening to all this discussion. And then the, uh, the Sedgwick's, Sedgwick's motion to leave the word assembly out of the First Amendment is then, uh, is then rejected. Um, but, you know, Page had somehow made Sedgwick's point for him uh, because the point was that it is not possible to make a complete list of natural rights, and when you do include some points of detail, like the right of assembly, it appear you Congress will have appeared to have deliberately left others uh, out. You've heard the argument, I'm sure, many times. Uh, you know, the Constitution doesn't say anything about, you know, fill in the blank, the right of abortion, gay marriage, uh, parental uh, rights to educate their uh, children, to, to, to carry uh, uh, guns outside of a of a militia and so forth. Uh, people say, well, the Constitution doesn't say anything about those rights. We must not uh, have them. Well, that, so we're, we're beginning to get a sense, I hope, of why the idea of having an incomplete, a necessarily incomplete Bill of Rights might actually be uh, dangerous. Um, but to explore this a bit more, and to understand why both the opponents and the proponents of the Bill of Rights understood the danger that we're talking about, uh, we need to advert to the pre-constitutional understanding of rights, what we might call Lockean rights theory and recognition of John Locke, whose second treatise on government was one of the sources of thinking about these matters. Now, the first step in the argument is to recognize that our founders believed in the existence of rights before there was a constitution and before there was a government. That is to say that the Bill of Rights did not create rights, it recognized pre-existing rights. Uh, have you ever thought about the peculiar way that the Bill of Rights is worded, especially the verbs? Uh, the First Amendment speaks of Congress not abridging the freedom of speech. The Due Process Clause speaks of not depriving the people of life, liberty, or property. 
Uh, the Ninth Amendment speaks of certain rights that are retained by the people. Well, rights can't be abridged, deprived, or retained unless they existed before. So if we take the words of the Bill of Rights seriously, our basic freedoms were not created or established by the Constitution. Rather, the freedom of speech, along with life, liberty, prop and property, and everything else, uh, pre-existed the Constitution. The Bill of Rights merely forbade the new federal government from abridging these freedoms. Remember the Lockean social contract. Human beings are endowed by nature with a broad set of natural rights, beginning with our ownership of ourselves and of the product of our labors. Human beings are free to do whatever they wish with their bodies and their property, short of violating the natural law, which means depriving other people of what justly pertains to them. As Locke put it, and I quote, the state of nature is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they see fit within the bounds of the law of nature without asking leave or depending upon the will of any other man. But it's important to note that this idea of natural rights, the rights of persons in the state of nature, is nothing at all like our modern conceptions of fundamental rights, inalienable rights, human rights, or constitutional rights. This is because the essence of the social contract is that we relinquish certain of our natural rights, most fundamentally the right to be a judge in our own case and to do violent, use violence against others, and we receive in return more effectual protection for certain of our rights, plus the enjoyment of positive rights, that is, rights that are created by the action of political society. Civil rights are the rights we enjoy after entering the state of civil society. Some civil rights are also natural rights, but now enjoying the more secure protection of civil society. Some civil rights are purely positive. But the point is that natural rights, you cannot assume that merely because something is a natural right that it is something which is immune to being uh, invaded by the government. It is, in fact, the essence of the social contract to relinquish some natural rights in exchange for the protections of civil society. Um, and this was not a, uh, this is not a controversial doctrine at the time of our founding. This was something that was in common between you know, anti-federalists and federalists alike. I won't bore you with a lot of quotes. Later on, you'll hear, I'll hear Madison uh, making an argument based on this. But uh, the leading anti-federalist writer who wrote under the pseudonym of Brutus uh, put it this way. Uh, I, he, he's arguing in favor of a Bill of Rights. And he taught you refer. He summarizes Lockean social contract theory in this uh, in this essay, uh, and then he says, in order to create civil society through the social contract, to effect this, it was necessary. And I'm now quoting: It was necessary that a certain portion of natural liberty should be surrendered in order that what remained should be preserved. And then the question is, of course, you know, how much is given up and how much is. Uh, uh, is uh, retained. Uh, and back to Brutus. So much, however, must be given up as will be sufficient to enable those to whom the administration of the government has committed to establish laws for the promoting of the happiness of the community and to carry those laws into effect. But it is not necessary for this purpose that individuals should relinquish all of their natural rights. Some are of a nature that they cannot be surrendered, of this kind are the rights of conscience, uh, the right of enjoying and defending life, etc. Others are not necessary to be resigned in order to attain the end for which government is instituted, and these, therefore, ought not to be uh, given up. The important point is that the boundary between the rights we retain and the rights we relinquish is determined not by logic or not by nature or uh, or some sort of outside source, but by agreement, by contract, by the social contract, by constitution making, by an actual act of the people. And this was what constitution making was all about from a Lockean point of view, determining which rights and powers we relinquish to society and which we retain. Now keep an eye on this word retained rights, because as Brutus says, these are the natural rights that are not necessary to give up in order to attain the chosen ends of government. Right? Note also that individual rights and government powers are reciprocal. 
We have the right to do with our person and property whatever we wish, short of injuring others, unless we have given the government the power to abridge it. Thus, do you have a natural right to travel as fast as you wish down an empty highway? Sure you do, in a state of nature. But when the government is given the authority to set speed limits and does so, you no longer have that right in civil society. The right is relinquished. Now probably the biggest difference between the social contract theory of, of Locke and that of a number of other thinkers, Thomas Hobbes, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Pufendorf, and, and some others, is that in, the, in, in their social contract, Hobbes's, for example, we relinquish all of our natural rights to the sovereign in, in return for protection. Whereas in Locke's social contract, we relinquish only those rights we deem necessary for the legitimate operations of civil government. So the question becomes, what are these retained rights? And in a pre-constitutional world, that is before there's a Bill of Rights, before there's a written constitution, how were the, such rights protected? There was no need to define the scope of retained rights in the pre-constitutional system. We had the right to do with our persons and property whatever we deemed fit, except insofar as we, re we relinquished the right under the social contract or would violate the state of nature. Thus, to determine whether an individual had a right to do a particular thing, the proper question was, did the people relinquish to the government the authority to abridge this right? And did the legislature properly exercise that authority through legislation, regulation, or the common law? If not, we retain the right and have the freedom to exercise it. In other words, the powers of government are defined and the rest is the sphere of freedom. That is what Hamilton meant when he said that there was no need to spell out a Bill of Rights. The powers of the new federal government were carefully enumerated. Well, what was left belonged either to the states or to the people. But how were these rights protected as a practical matter? Partly, largely, of course, through representat our representatives in Parliament or the legislature. That was the point of Republican government. But Anglo-Americans were a legal culture, and rights enjoyed legal protection, even before some of them were enumerated in the form of a written Bill of Rights. I want to describe to you two pre-Bill of Rights, two cases that were decided uh, in the courts uh, in the a decade and a half prior to the adoption of the Bill of Rights. And I'll argue to you that these are typical, but you'll just have to trust me for that. But I'll describe the cases. The first is, is a case called Rutgers versus Waddington, in which, by the way, Alexander Hamilton was counsel for the, uh, uh, for the defendant. Uh, the, um, uh, this involved the uh, rights to the to property during the British occupation of New York during the Revolution. As you probably remember, the British troops occupied New York during almost the entire American Revolution. Well, Elizabeth Rutgers, who was a, a pro-revolutionary patriot, fled the city. She was the owner of a brewer, brewery and alehouse uh, in New York. And while she was gone and the British troops occupied New York, well, of course, they wanted a beer. Uh, and so uh, the British occupying authorities licensed uh, some British um, merchants to operate Ms. Rutgers' uh, brewery, brewery and alehouse. And then when the um, uh, British get thrown out and the, and the uh, uh, New York patriots become the government and the, and the end of the war, uh, they pass a lot of anti-Tory legislation. And one of the pieces of legislation they pass is called the Trespass Act, which gives a right to people who own property that was used during the occupation to sue for the, uh, uh, for the value of the property during the time it was being used. The only trouble with this is that it was a fairly well-established principle of international law at the time uh, that occupying military forces had the right to uh, use abandoned property uh, during the occupation and that there was no right of get uh, after the fact to, uh, uh, to obtain uh, redress. And so you have this newly enacted New York statute. On the one hand, you have a principle of, of uh, international law uh, on the other, and what are you going to do? Well, here's the decision of the, uh, of the court. Um, the court decides partly, largely in favor of the British defendants in the case. And, and the our argument is this. The, um, 
the judge says, the supremacy of the legislature need not be called into question. That is, the legislature can do whatever it wants. Right? Remember, this is pre-constitutional. There's no, no Bill of Rights, no written constitution. Uh, so the legislature can do what it wants. Uh, if, they, if they think positively to enact a law, there is no power which can control them. Uh, where the main object of such a law is clearly expressed and the intention manifests, the judges are not at liberty, although it appears to them to be unreasonable to reject it, which would be subversive of all government. So we, the judges, do not have the power to uh, override statutes just because we think that they're wrong or unreasonable or in violation of, uh, of uh, un unwritten international norms uh, if the legislature really intended it. But what he then did is proceeded to look, to give a very narrow, one might say, grudging construction to the words of the Trespass Act, concluded that the legislature could probably did not intend, this is really a bit of a legal fiction, but essentially concluded that the legislature could not have intended the statute to apply under the circumstances of this particular case, and thus the court held that, uh, uh, that, the, uh, def that the defendant would win, essentially that the international norm would, uh, would prevail instead of the uh, Trespass Act. Well, the other case I was going to describe is called Somerset's case. Uh, it's a, an English case. Uh, it involved a Virginian who brought his slave named Somerset with him on a trip to London. And while in London, uh, the, the Somerset escapes. Uh, he's then recaptured and held uh, in, the, in, a, uh, uh, in chains in a ship uh, uh, in the Thames, and some abolitionists go out and bring, get some lawyers for Somerset and bring an act, an act, a writ of habeas corpus to challenge the legality of Somerset being held uh, as a slave uh, on the ground that there's no slavery in England, right? And, uh, and Lord Mansfield, uh, very distinguished English judge, reasons as follows. He says, he, he, he describes slavery, he says, so high an act of dominion, this is holding someone as a slave, must be recognized by the law of the country where it is used. The state of slavery is of such a nature that it is incapable of being introduced on any reasons, moral or political, but only by positive law. It is so odious that nothing can be suffered to support it but positive law. So then he searches the statutes of England and the common law decisions of England and can find nothing affirmatively authorizing slavery in England, even though at this time there are about 14 or 15,000 people being held in slavery in England. Right? But he says uh, there, can be no, there is no slavery in England and he frees Somerset. Note, though, that positive law trumps. Uh, Lord Mansfield says this would not be true if we were talking about the plantations, which is the term he used for the American colonies in the, in, in the West Indies. In those places, there was positive law establishing slavery, and so positive law uh, would, uh, uh, would prevail. Now, these two cases have a couple of things in common. Both of them involve general norms of liberty in the case of Somerset or of international uh, uh, behavior uh, in the uh, Rutgers versus Waddington situation. Um, and both courts recognize that those norms have to give way to the legislature. The legislature is supreme. They do not contend, neither court contends, that those general norms uh, uh, trump the legislature. But when they see the conflict in both cases, uh, the, the judges take a very close and narrow construction of the statute, and they presume that the legislature must not have intended to violate natural law or international norms unless the, unless the intention is quite clearly expressed by the legislature. And then by giving a narrow construction, they then, the, the, uh, the uh, broader uh, uh, unwritten norm uh, prevailed in both uh, both cases. Um, 
So as we can see from these examples, in a pre-constitutional world where you don't have a written constitution or a bill of rights, rights exist, natural rights exist, and they are legally enforceable, but they're not trumps. They are background principles or default rules that can be displaced by positive law, but only where the positive law is specific enough and explicit enough to indicate that the legislature really and truly intended to, for the uh, uh, for them to be displaced. Now, constitutional rights would be different than this. When you have expressly enumerated constitutional rights, they have the same juridical status as expressly enumerated governmental powers, and they are understood as limitations on the powers. The First Amendment, first words of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging freedom of speech. Uh, and, and, uh, and so forth. So the Constitution has as its logical form grants of powers and then certain restrictions on those powers and those restrictions actually are they're legally enforceable restrictions. They are trumps. Hence in our system the question is not with respect to constitutional rights isn't the question is not did the legislature really and truly intend to, uh, uh, to invade them. We don't care. Right, because if it's if it's a constitutional right, then it prevails no matter how explicit, no matter how intentional uh, the legislative uh, action may be. You know, even if it is easier to keep the peace, the government can pre uh, if the government can prevent speakers from riling up the crowd, the First Amendment prevents it. Even if it would facilitate the collection of taxes to search a merchant's warehouse without a warrant, the Fourth Amendment forbids it. Thus, once rights are enumerated in the Constitution, we no longer merely ask whether there's explicit enough positive law within the enumerated powers to authorize the challenged governmental action. We also ask whether the challenged action abridges or invades the enumerated freedoms. So now we can return to the founding and see why good Lockean rights theorists would regard the enumeration of rights as dangerous. Right. Madison, on the floor of the House of Representatives, when he is proposing the Bill of Rights, uh, makes the, uh, the, the following comment. He says, it has also been objected against a Bill of Rights that by enumerating particular exceptions to the grant of power, it would disparage those rights which were not placed in that enumeration. And it might follow by implication that those rights which were not singled out were intended to be assigned into the hands of the general government and were consequently uh, insecure. Or uh, anti-federalist federal farmer, writing under the name federal farmer. Further, the people thus establishing some few rights and remaining totally silent about others similarly circumstanced, the implication indubitably is that they mean to relinquish the latter or at least feel indifferent about them. The interpretive principle at play here is one that we still use call by its Latin name in, in law school, the, the, uh, the principle of expressio unius, or expressio unius est exclusio alturius, that is to express or enumerate one thing is to uh, exclude the others. And so if you have a list and only some things are mentioned, it isn't, you're not being just neutral about the unmentioned ones, you're actually excluding them. So if, if the law school were to announce that juniors and seniors have the day off on, on next Wednesday, that would mean that freshmen and sophomores don't. Right? It's not just, oh, well, what about us? Right? It, it, they still have to come. Uh, and, and, the, um, and, and thus, if we think of the Constitution as the social compact, determining which natural rights we retain and which ones we relinquish, and if part of the Constitution is a list of rights, Madison and the federal farmer would conclude that we have actually relinquished all the natural rights that are not included in the list. That's why the Bill of Rights was thought to be dangerous. But Madison says he has a solution to the problem, that he can deal with this, and, and, what he, and his solution is the Ninth Amendment. And so uh, just at, at the in, end of the speech I just mentioned, Madison refers to the Ninth, and here's what the Ninth Amendment says. It says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Right? So this, the Ninth Amendment is an express reference to retained rights 
under Lockean rights theory, and it is a, an, a denial of the principle of expressio unius. It's saying just because we've listed some rights does not deny or disparage um, any others. So uh, what protection is accorded to the rights retained by the people? The Supreme Court has never said. You know, the Ninth Amendment may be there, but the Supreme Court has, uh, uh, has mentioned it on about two occasions and never uh, seriously applied it. And so we're completely in the realm of speculation. Uh, one possibility, which I ask you seriously to consider, is this, that the rights retained by the people enjoy precisely the same status that they had before the Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution that they are not relinquished, denied, or, dis or disparaged. Neither, however, are they elevated or turned into constitutional rights. They don't become trumps. These unenumerated rights retain their pre-constitutional status. We continue to enjoy these rights and may enforce them in court if necessary, unless, upon examination of the social contract, by which we mean the Constitution, and the laws enacted pursuant to it, it is sufficiently clear that they have been relinquished, using thus precisely the methodology used in these pre-constitutional cases. And if we were to take this theory of retained rights seriously, it might produce a jurisprudence of unenumerated rights that is quite different from what we have today. Uh, for about the last 50 years, if not longer, the Supreme Court has lurched unpredictably between two diametrically opposed understandings of unenumerated rights. One view associated with Justices Blackmun and Brennan and others is that judges are entitled to recognize new rights under such broad rubrics as substantive due process or privacy, and that these are understood as constitutional rights, as trumps, just like the enumerated rights of the Bill of Rights. We see this most conspicuously in Roe versus Wade and Lawrence against Texas, but there have been numerous other instances too, such as Lochner against New York. Now the alternative view, which is associated with Robert Bork, Justice Scalia, and others, is that unless a supposed right can be traced to the text of the Constitution understood in light of its original public meaning or lies outside any enumerated power of government, judges have no authority to override the acts of the legislature. But what would be the jurisprudence of retained rights under the Ninth Amendment? We know from Lockean and Wright's theory and the debates over the Bill of Rights that there are numerous rights of the people that were not relinquished, from the right to wear a hat to the right to rear our children and many, many more. Applying the methodology of Rutgers against Washington, uh, Waddington and Somerset, we might well proceed as follows. We determine whether the asserted right is sufficiently supported by past practice and right reason that it is unlikely that it would have been relinquished. Then we examine positive law, the acts of the legislature, to determine whether the asserted right has in fact been relinquished through a sufficiently explicit and intentional exercise of enumerated power. And if not, to recognize and enforce the right subject, however, to the possibility of a prospective legislative override, because after all, the legislature remains uh, supreme. Now, this may sound unfamiliar. It doesn't sound like constitutional law at all, but you, there are actually cases in the Supreme Court where without identifying it as such, this seems to be the way that they have operated. Uh, one uh, fairly recent example is the oddly named case of Zedvitus versus Davis. This is a case involving the indefinite detention of aliens in the United States uh, whom the government thinks would be dangerous to release but who can't be removed to their own country. And uh, there's a, uh, a statute uh, provides that all aliens who are ordered to be removed can be detained for 90 days pending their removal, but then uh, the Attorney General is given the authority that, that, that they, quote, may be detained beyond the removal period and, if released, so on. They may be detained beyond the normal removal period. And the Attorney General interpreted this statute in accordance with its terms to say, as long as we want, as long as we think is necessary, indefinite. Well, the Supreme Court, invoking a general idea of justice, perhaps embodied in the, in the due process clause that 
people can't be held forever without charges or having done uh, you know, anything wrong, uh, uh, looks at the statute. Instead of saying that the statute is unconstitutional, what the court says is we are going to construe the statute to contain an implicit reasonable time limitation. Right? So they look at the statute and they construe it narrowly, just as the court did in Rutgers against Waddington, in order to uh, conform to the general background norm of justice, but without saying that it's actually unconstitutional. So in theory, Congress could come back and say, yeah, we really did mean that, right? And then they would have to decide whether it's actually unconstitutional uh, or not. Um, Hem down against Rumsfeld, a much more famous case, you know, had essentially the same uh, uh, logic to it. Again, a general principle against detaining folks, now we're talking about the detainees in, uh, in uh, Guantanamo, indefinitely without charges. Uh, government argues that the authorization for use of military force authorizes the executive branch to hold them uh, there uh, based upon the findings of military commissions. Uh, Supreme Court looks at that, finds a tension between the background norm and the statute. They give the authorization for use of military force statute a narrow construction and hold, and I'll read you the key language from Hamdan. They hold it, quote, absent a more specific congressional authorization that the executive could not employ military commissions. Then in the next case that comes along, Congress in fact passes a more specific authorization uh, and the Supreme Court holds that military commissions can in fact be, uh, uh, be used. It sounds a lot like the logical uh, uh, structure of, uh, of Rutgers versus uh, Waddington, but usually the Supreme Court has not approached unenumerated rights cases this way. One final example, that of um, of homosexual uh, sexual conduct. There have been two Supreme Court cases on this uh, uh, issue, and neither and, and, and they illustrate the lurching between the other uh, extremes. Bowers against Hardwick was the first case, and in this case, the Supreme Court adopted a broad construction of the state law, uh, looked at the Constitution, and saw that there was no express constitutional right involved, and reasoned that therefore Mr. Hardwick did not have any constitutional right. Uh, that was uh, that was infringed. Um, the um, you know the court could have looked at it slightly differently. It could have said that before allowing enforcement of the, of an old and vaguely worded statute, it would require a more explicit indication of legislative intent to cover the conduct in question, and then they would say, interpreting the, the law narrowly, then they would leave it to the legislature and find out whether the legislature actually wanted to pass a new statute that would specifically uh, target homosexual sexual uh, uh, conduct. That, however, is not what they did. They simply said, let the broad statute uh, be enforced. And then the same issue comes up again in Lawrence against Texas. Uh, this time, uh, again, the court pays no attention to whether there's an actual and explicit legislative intent, only they go the other way. They regard the statute as violating a fundamental freedom, albeit one not spelled out in the Constitution anywhere, and hold, therefore, that the state statute is unconstitutional, and it doesn't really matter what the legislature intends. Right. Uh, now, this retained rights approach, which I've been throwing out as a possibility here, thus differs from conservative judicial restraint because it allows the judiciary to enforce traditionally protected but unenumerated rights in the absence of explicit positive law to the contrary. But it differs from modern judicial activism because it does not treat the courts as the final word. It gives the representatives of the people an opportunity to determine law for the future where the Constitution is silent so that the legislative branch can serve as a check on the judiciary just as the judiciary serves as a check on the legislative branch leaving the people as the ultimate authority over both. Now I leave it to you to evaluate whether such a form of judicial review has advantages over the two modern alternatives. Uh, for now, I would suggest only that a study of the framers' own concerns about the problem of enumerating rights might be a helpful way to open our minds to a different understanding of unenumerated rights and constitutionalism.
Thank you. Thank you, Judge McConnell. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, let me uh, encourage you to keep your questions brief. And also, because this program is being webcast uh, and will be archived and available on the law school website, I'm told by the close of business tomorrow, um, we need for you to wait to get um, a microphone so that uh, uh, so that your question can be uh, picked up uh, for the webcast. Hi, thank you for being here, Judge McConnell. Uh, one question I have: You've illustrated uh, some con some concerns about uh, an unenumerated rights jurisprudence that might open the door to judges simply imposing their policy preferences to pick two popular boogeymen. Lochner, which is despised by the left, and Roe, which is despised by the right. My concern with the sort of Ninth Amendment regime you've illustrated here, it seems that under that regime, the legislature is free to deprive us of any unenumerated rights we might retain as long as there's majoritarian positive law behind it. So I'm wondering if you can speak to that concern. I mean, I, I think that's, that's exactly right. Uh, you're going to have to decide, you know, whether that's the the regime you'd like to live under. Uh, but in de but in, in defense of that, I would just say that these are rights that are, have not been since they haven't been enumerated. They are not constitutional rights, and they are given then precisely the same degree of protection that they would have been given if we had not had if, that all rights would have been given if we had never had a Bill of Rights at all. Okay. Um, don't you think a distinction needs to be made um, between those rights which are uh, re relinquished by the people and, and those rights wi wi which are re relinquished by cer certain sections of the people, cer certain, um, certain committees that, that sit together and decide which which of our rights are, are, are going to be re relinquished or not. It, isn't that a, a, a valid distinction to make? Well, we have a Republican form of government, which means not, not a pure democracy. That means that we elect representatives, uh, and uh, that is, that's the way the people's will is expressed in our system. I'm wondering if you could discuss the concept of immunity with regards to enumerated rights and the um, when a legislature passes a law, a majoritarian law, whether they make themselves immune and whether or not uh, that is within their power. Um, I'm not uh, entirely sure that I understand the question. Uh, uh, there's a pretty firm doctrine of legislative immunity, which holds that legislators may not themselves be sued for the laws that they vote for and enact, unlike executive officials uh, who can be sued for, uh, uh, for enforcing uh, laws that are contrary to clearly established constitutional rights. If I might specify, I was thinking more of the qualified immunities um, afforded Fourth Amendment, Fifth Amendment violations, as opposed to the absolute immunities afforded judicial, legislative. Uh. Well, again, I mean, are we? Um, do I assume we're talking about executive officials like police? Yes. Okay, so not legislators at all. Uh, can is the question? Can the can Congress extend, uh, ex expand the immunities that were traditionally available? Um, I'm I'm not sure. I haven't thought this through. But what I think I would say is that the um, is that Congress cannot deprive people altogether of a remedy 
for any constitutional right, but the form of that remedy need not necessarily be a suit for money damages against the police officer. If, for example, uh, the, uh, there was a substitute of a suit for damages against the city, I would think that that would be, uh, and making the individual officer immune, I would think that that would probably uh, be constitutional. But uh, I don't know. The, the immunity doctrines that we have are almost entirely uh, you know, 19th century common law <laughs> immunities that have been carried over uh, into, into present practice. I had a question. Um, first, I uh, really enjoyed your talk. I'm glad you came here. But um, I had a question under the Ninth Amendment idea you're suggesting how, like, let's say, the rights of African Americans or women will be treated. That I mean, I, I, get, I assume the first question would be like the framers didn't specify gender or race, and so yeah, I, I'm thinking that might be the first question. But then would the approach then go to a current Congress and say, well, do you intend for these classes to have equal rights? And if they say no. Would that like would that be? I'm sorry. What was the term you used? Like, would that be the final answer? Well, in in the first instance, I would see this as an interpretation of the Equal Protection Clause of the Fourteenth Amendment. Um, nothing, and uh, this talk was not about how to interpret the the clauses that are in the Constitution, but rather what to do with the silences of the Constitution uh, in the Bill of Rights. And you know, as to the Equal Protection Clause, uh, if, you, if you look at the way it was worded, it doesn't say that it applies only to race. It says uh, that uh, no state shall deny to any person within the jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Uh, and uh, I think that the argument that it was just to apply to race is actually not very strong as a historical matter. When the I, mean, I don't know how much we want to get into this, but it is uh, when the uh, chief Senate sponsor of the 14th Amendment is on the floor of the Senate explaining uh, the meaning of the, of the amendment, somebody pops up and says, uh, essentially, well, what about women? And, uh, and he scratches his head and he says, I don't know, I never thought about that. <laughs> he didn't say, no, are you kidding? <laughs> Maybe one more question. Why do you list yourself first as a professor of law and second as a judge? On, on what? <laughs> I guess you don't. Well, people usually list their highest title first. <laughs> Um, on, on that note, uh, as a professor, I, I think we should, should call it an evening. Before we leave, uh, two things. First of all, um, I have uh, a small token, if I can get this open, uh, for Judge McConnell um, from the law school with appreciation, the Honorable Michael W. McConnell, Sumner Canary Memorial Lecture, October 15th, 2008. Thank you very much. And you are all invited to a reception upstairs in Blackacre where we can continue the conversation. Thank you very much.